Next up, we have Miguel Perez Gibson. He's here in his capacity as the Forest Policy Advisor for the Washington Environmental Council. He also has long-standing experience in these woods, and indeed, about this time a year ago, Miguel climbed some very fierce slopes with me, and we had a really nice lunch way up there in the woods. Please welcome Miguel Perez Gibson. Hi, everybody. Hey, yeah, a lot of friendly faces here. Hey, good to see you all. Thanks for giving up part of your Saturday. Actually, you're not giving up. You're going to gain. And um, I want to just uh, give some thanks to all the people that worked hard putting this event together. Tremendous event. The videos, the slides, the work you put into it. Thank you, and I, I, I'm glad to be at the first of what I hope are many more summits for the Center for Responsible Forestry. Uh, is my wife here? Oh, okay. I didn't know she'd show up or not, but that's Marianne. So this morning, I was trying to figure out what to say today, and she's like, stop with all the jargon and acronyms and just tell a story. So I'm going to tell a story. I, I'm just going to tell an old story, and then we're going to have a new story. And there's a good friend of mine, Mr. Miller. How are you doing? There's one of the guys who, if you really want to see someone who loves the land and loves their trees, you've got to go out to Ken Miller's place. He does great work. So good to see you, Ken. Welcome yeah. So, um, gosh, you know, you got to set the mood for a story, don't you? So we're going to go back uh, 30 years. Now just kind of go back and talk. close your eyes if you want. Okay, everyone back there. <laughs> so, uh, this story is about a bird, uh, trees, and what would you think the third thing is? No, money. <laughs> so, it started about 30 years ago. Um, under President Clinton and Commissioner Jennifer Belcher. Uh, this old story recently came to closure after four presidents and four commissioners, and now a new story is emerging around naturally regenerating older forests, or as coined, legacy forests. So, 1992, uh, Washington State had liquidated much of the remaining old growth on private, state, and federal land to the extent uh, that the northern spotted owl was listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act of 1973. I think sometimes we get a little too far away from our own history to recognize how fortunate we are to have these laws that were passed by people who had the vision. And I'm just gonna acknowledge this Endangered Species Act by just reading to you just a little bit from it. So just bear with me for a minute. That this is how the act started. It's an act to provide for the conservation of endangered and threatened species of fish, wildlife, and plants for other purposes. And the findings by Congress finds and declares that various species of fish, wildlife, and plants in the United States have been rendered extinct as a consequence of economic growth and development untempered by adequate concern and conservation. I think that's what you're all about here today, adequate concern and conservation. The United States has pledged itself as a sovereign state in the international community to conserve to the extent practicable the various species of fish, wildlife, plants facing extinction. So after that act was passed about 20 years later, we, and I say we because I'm happy to have my colleague here from way back, and Dr. Swedeen is just, she will correct everything I said that's wrong because she has all the numbers, and, but she'll bear with me, I hope. Um, so about 20 years after that act was written, um, and the Northern Spotted Owl was listed as an endangered species, uh, we at DNR advocated that the Commissioner Belcher, I was working there at the time, 
continue to manage our state forests under a habitat conservation plan that could be approved by Fish and Wildlife so we could continue to manage their state forests while conserving habitat for the northern spotted owl. Jennifer said, no, forget it. Seriously. If we're going to do an HCP, I want it for all endangered species, not just one. I want to include salmon. I want to include marble murrelet. And in addition, she said, I want, I want that HCP to cover all species. I want us to manage for the conservation of all species. So in 1996, Secretary of the Interior under President Clinton, Bruce Babbitt, attended the ceremony that awarded first in the nation, why here in Washington State, the all species HCP. That's what we have. That's what we're working under. Only one slight hitch, and this is where, bear with me, we're going to get to Legacy Forest, but here's the one slight hitch. We needed to learn about the marble murrelet to manage the forest to create and maintain the required habitat for that bird. And by the way, great book on marble murrelet, written by one of our own authors, Maria Ruth. Is she here by any chance? No, but you know Maria. Okay, it's called Rare Bird. Okay, you must be related. All right, good. We plugged your book. Get it, browsers, you know. Um, yeah, so we needed to, for the, so the, the HCP, we committed to setting aside around 190, eventually setting aside around 190,000 acres of potential habitat for this bird. But we had to do scientific research to determine if that was this habitat was needed. And so the research was done around 12 years later, and Dr. Swedeen was on that team, and the scientific report was written in 2008. I know it's a long story, but we've got a new story, but you need to understand this to know, what the heck, how did we get here? How did my, how's my state logging these lands? I don't get it. Well, DNR was required to amend the HCP with this long-term conservation strategy for Merlettes. That only happened recently, and it was submitted by Commissioner Franz and approved by the President Trump administration in 2019 under the Secretary of the Interior, Zinke, who, as you may recall, was trying to reduce the size of national parks and monuments. So in our mind, it wasn't the best conservation strategy that was submitted to the Washington, uh, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In any case, when DNR developed this strategy, they had several alternatives that they were going to consider. And this is the way they looked at it. They said, we, we, we have the fiduciary responsibility under the state to generate revenue, exercise care and skill. We've got to act prudently, but we've got to act impartially to future generations. So they had this trust mandate. And they also said when they were going to develop the marble murrelet plan that they would minimize impacts of murrelets and serve all existing habitat and nests. I'm going to skip all this. There's a whole series of things for the marble murrelet. So here's the part where we get to the legacy forest. They developed eight alternatives, and they were called A through H. Four of them seemed to get the most focus. That was alternative B, and that was favored by uh, our good friends in the timber industry. F and G were favored by the environmental community, and H, which is what DNR selected and submitted to the uh, United States Department of Fish and Wildlife for approval. So, um, the alternatives, just to give you a sense, um, I mentioned earlier the 190,000 acres. Um, alternative F, which is, uh, would conserve 107,000 acres at the end of the final decade, but it would allow the harvest of 5,000 supreme old great marble murrelet habitat. Um, alternative G, which is the one that we favored, uh, was 84,000, but it excluded that primal 5,000 acres of high quality habitat. And then H uh, would conserve 66,000, this is the one the DNR adopted, and it would include the cutting of 5,000 acres of primo marble murrelet habitat. And then the other thing you gotta know about this situation, in which we, I think we can change, we'll get to the new story, is that they looked at net present value. Believe it or not, the difference was in terms of dollars to me, uh, F was 3.1 billion net present value, H was 3.67, and G, the preferred in our mind, was 3.5. Anyway, they had to go with, the, they took the highest net present value, which we think conserved, not, 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 not. So, uh, we had 195,000 acres off limits from harvest. 
since 1992. So here we are 30 years later. Eric's out there walking around his forest that he's been enjoying for years, and all of a sudden he sees a timber sale tag. What the heck? Well, DNR told, at the time that the, the, they approved, the board approved this long-term conservation strategy, DNR told the board that over 150,000 acres would be available for harvest. Those are the trees, those are the forests that contain the legacy forests. Um, and so the acres released overall was uh, under H, was just under 40,000 acres. I'm not going to go into the other alternatives. But that's 40,000 acres of what? Clear cut. Not ecologically based forest management that we might like to see, not thinnings and Jerry Franklin type of forestry. No, it's, it's clear cut. So the Board of Natural Resources approved that strategy, and the vote though was five to one. The one vote opposed to it was the governor. And then the feds approved it. Um, but that is why every month, the board has legacy forest sales before it and they approve it every time, even though the, the public's petitioning not to. They're all doing it under the guise of this long-term marble muralette conservation strategy. However, we have a new story. Everybody awake? I get my harmonica out. Um, the Washington State Supreme Court in uh, Conservation Northwest versus Hillary Franz, we challenged that marble muralette plan. We lost. Uh, although we lost on the claims of the merit around the plan, court deferred to them. But the court did say and this is where we come in, that the DNR does not have to maximize revenue to the trust, and that all public benefits can be considered when managing state land. Okay, so that's where we are. And today, the board is now in the process of approving a new harvest plan, what they call a sustainable harvest plan, and also new policies around how those older forests carbon sequestration, ecologically based forest management, consideration for neighborhood forests, could all be included in the calculation. So today, I'm going to give you a thing to do. We must advocate to the board to consider new policies. The good news, uh, Commissioner Goldmark mentioned that um, the board uh, voted against the settlement agreement. That was a great thing. They also approved a resolution which we weren't totally happy with, but it had parts that we are happy with, and those parts opened the door for the board to consider how to manage these legacy forests. And the, and the resolution says that, I'm just quoting from some of it here, that for instance, look, if you're going to look at present net worth, look at public rates, public land trusts. Look at what's more reasonable for public lands. Um, the additional objectives to be considered may include, but are not limited to, now this is the board telling DNR, when you look at the new harvest, additional objectives, I want to make that clear, multiple objectives, may include, but are not limited to, stored carbon, watershed protection, this is all as of, as of last week, folks, fish and wildlife habitat attributes, ecological functions, associated carbon sequestration, forest health, landscape structural diversity, and local community economies. Explanation and inclusion of alternative harvest techniques. Alternative harvest techniques to be considered may include, but are not limited to, different levels of tree retention and alternative thinning regimes. So, there are avenues today that we can pursue for not just the, for the legacy forest, but also with all 2.2 million acres that are under the DNR's management. And I want to make one thing really clear, if I haven't made it clear yet. Now, um, we are not uh, anti-forestry. And uh, folks tend to want to coin this movement as anti-forestry. And I would say, no, it's pro-forestry. It's pro-ecologically based management. May not, may be anti-agronomic, agronomic forestry, or tree farms, or plantations, but not forestry. I think we have to remain make that clear. Thank you. 
Uh, I've got one other book that I'd recommend. Um, it just came out, it's called The Tree Line. And it's about the forest circumnavigating the Arctic. Those forests are moving north at a rate of not centimeters a year, 40 or 50 meters a year. So we are in a climate crisis. We don't know that we'll ever be able to grow the kind of forests we have today that are 80 or 90 years old. Even today, the Webster Nursery is going down and collecting seed from Southern Oregon, recognizing that the phenology of trees may change, will change. Okay, Eric's got the hook out, and I, I told him I, I would try to make this reasonably short. He actually wanted me to talk about other stuff. I just, I'm running out of time, sorry, Eric. <laughs> Thank you.